Welcome to the GK Chesterton Studio. I'm Cy Kellett, and I get to sit right here at this desk each weekday to host Catholic Answers Live. I'm joined by some of the best apologists, theologians, and ministers you'll find anywhere as they respond to caller questions about Catholic life and faith. Today, we'd like to share with you some of the best of those questions and answers. We'll be joined by Catholic Answers apologists Tim Staples, Trent Horn, Jimmy Aiken, and Carlo Broussard, and by Catholic historian Steve Weidenkopf and Chaldean priest, theologian, and philosopher Father Andrew Yonan. The questions they address in this episode include, how can we evangelize without seeming pushy? Is the woman described in Revelation chapter 12 Mary? How can we start a conversation with someone who practices Hinduism? Does the Bible specifically mention the Pope, Cardinals, or Bishops? And much more. Thanks for joining us. We really hope you enjoy the show. My question has to do with uh, Revelation 12. So how yeah. do you convince a non-Catholic that the woman in Revelation 12 is Mary? And can you specifically talk about like the 12 stars, uh, you know, the moon and, and the sun and all that, and how to, uh, like, strong reasons for, you know, okay. why it is Mary, yes. All right, sure. Well, first of all, Rock, thanks for the question. It's a great question, by the way. And I think there are some good reasons that we can give to suggest that this woman John is describing in Revelation 12 is indeed the Blessed Mother. The first line of reasoning that I would take, Rock, is the fact that if you notice, John is listing three different characters there. He's listing the woman, he's listing the male child to whom she gives birth, and he's listing the great red dragon, which he calls the ancient serpent of, serpent of Ode. Now, Rock, in that passage, it's clear that the male child is an individual person, namely Jesus himself, because John describes Jesus as one ruling with an iron rod, which is a reference to the messianic prophecy in Psalm 2. So it's obviously Jesus that, Jesus is refer that John is referring to, Secondly, John, the great red dragon, is an individual. John tells us specifically, it's the ancient serpent of old, referencing Genesis chapter 3, uh, you know, the serpent entering into the garden, namely the devil himself. So out of the three characters, Rock, you have two characters that John is identifying as individual people. So it makes perfect sense to conclude within context that the woman is an individual person as well, like the male child and the dragon. And who is that person? Well, it's the mother of the messianic king, namely Mary. And so what's interesting here, Rock, is you have the context of three individual characters, and so it makes sense to conclude within context that the woman is an individual person, which we know to be Mary. But from that rock, it becomes evident that John is describing Mary as the queen mother, right? Which sort of complements our interpretation that this is Mary because he's describing Jesus in particular as the messianic king. And as we know, in the Davidic kingdom of Ode, which was based on ancient Near Eastern kingdoms, the queen was the mother. So here's John describing the mother of the king, namely Mary, and he describes her with, as you mentioned, Rock, a crown of 12 stars, signifying her queenship. And then furthermore, he goes on to describe how this woman has offspring, once again emphasizing her spiritual motherhood. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, John speaks of this great woman as having offspring, namely those who keep the commandments of Jesus Christ. Christians, right? So this woman is a spiritual mother, which goes toward the interpretation that she is the queen mother in this new restored Davidic kingdom. And who is the queen mother but Mary? So in light of the context of individual characters, in light of the queenship context of the messianic kingdom, we have good reason to conclude that it is indeed Mary. And then finally, I would say, Rock, that this passage of Revelation chapter 12, verses 1 through 5, parallels Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, where in Genesis 3, 15, you have three characters as well. The woman who gives birth to the child to crush the head of the serpent, right? So in that text, you have, and, and then God says that he will set enmity between the woman 
and her seed, and Satan and his seed. So you have this separation between the woman and the child of Genesis 3.15 and Satan and his seed. Well, when you come to Revelation 12, Rock, you find the woman and the child, and you have the red dragon, the serpent. But notice in Revelation 12, the woman flees from the serpent. And the serpent goes to wage war against her offspring. So you have a parallel between Revelation 12 and Genesis 3. So when you look at Genesis 3, Rock, and you look at those characters, the woman giving birth to the Messiah who's going to crush the head of the serpent, that's obviously Jesus and Satan. So who is the woman? Mary. And if Revelation 12 is paralleling Genesis 3.15, and you have the same characters, the woman, the male child, and the serpent, the dragon, well, then it makes perfect sense to conclude that the woman is indeed Mary. In this next clip, a caller wants to know if the Bible does not specifically mention the Pope, cardinals, or bishops, then why does the church have these offices in place? Well, actually, there is something like the Pope in the Bible. It's St. Peter. Um, Jesus gives St. Peter authority over the other apostles. That's real clear in a variety of passages. It's in Matthew 16, it's in Luke chapter 22, it's in John chapter 21. So uh, we have these passages that indicate Peter, of all the apostles, has a unique role that places him above the other apostles. Um, and so he's the chief apostle, he's ultimately the man responsible for Jesus' church once Jesus ascends back into heaven, and that's what the Pope is. Uh, so uh, that's where the office of the Pope came from. Now, the word Pope didn't exist yet in that form, but it's like uh, it's just a theological term that has developed over the course of time to refer to that special Petrine office, or office related to Peter. Uh, cardinals are basically bishops who hold—typically they're bishops, they're not always bishops, but they're basically advisors that the Pope has. And the Church doesn't claim that this is an office of divine institution. It's not. It's something that was instituted um, just because the Pope needed some advisors and needed people to share the work of his office with. And so it was something that developed over the course of time, but the Church doesn't claim it's a divine institution. So in, any more than, you know, a Church usher, which they have even in Protestant churches, well, that's not mentioned in the Bible, but there's a functional need for ushers, and so they get end up getting created both in Catholic churches and in Protestant churches, but there's no basis for them in the Bible, and no one would claim that it's a matter of doctrine that you need ushers. And in the same way, it's not a matter of doctrine that the Church should have cardinals. That's something that's purely discretionary. It's been a good policy, it's helped the Church out, uh, it's met a practical need, but it's not something we'd claim is Church teaching any more than we'd claim it's Church teaching that churches need ushers. Uh, in terms of bishops, actually, yeah, there, there are bishops in the New Testament. In fact, the term for bishop is used in the New Testament. In Greek, the word is episkopos. Uh, that's where we get the English word bishop. As you bring it over into English, the P sound on the front of it becomes a B, so episkopos becomes bishop, and um, and it's the office of bishop is mentioned in a number of passages, such as in the book of Titus, in the book of 1 Timothy, and the office functioned a little bit differently at that time than it does today, but uh, the concept and even the terminology is still there, though it would require a little more time than I have at the moment to tie that all together for you. Because I want to get to your second question, which is, how would you show somebody that uh, we don't need to do theology by Scripture alone, which is a common claim among our Protestant friends? Well, there are a number of ways to approach that, but the most fundamental one, I think, is to point out that if it's true that we need to validate all theological claims by Scripture alone, then you're going to need to validate sola scriptura by Scripture alone. You're going to need to ask the question, can this claim meet its own test? Because the claim that we need to validate all theological claims by Scripture alone is itself a theological claim. And so you're going to need to be able to show, using just the Bible, that you shouldn't use anything other than the Bible in order to do theology. And when you try to do that, it ends up not meeting its own test. There, it, It's very difficult to find verses that suggest anything like this, and there are a few that Protestant apologists will sometimes bring forward and say, well, this shows uh, sola scriptura is true, 
but it's pretty easy to refute those claims because uh, they end up, if you just contextualize them and say, well, okay, let's say St. Paul was teaching sola scriptura here in this verse. Did he really expect the people he was writing to to not listen to anything he said unless he wrote it down? You know, that's clearly not the case, especially when you have other statements in St. Paul's writings saying, adhere to all of the traditions I gave you, whether by word of mouth or by epistle. So it's clearly not Paul's view that he's only authoritative when he's writing a letter. Uh, he thinks he's authoritative as an apostle when he teaches authoritatively as an apostle, whether it's in a letter or not. And so a simple examination of the context will help you with that. Uh, if you'd like more information on that, I suggest going to catholic.com. We have a lot of information there online for free that deals exactly with this question that we've put online for you right there. Thank you very much for that uh, call, John. What is the best way to evangelize to someone that might be questioning their faith or is new to the faith without coming off as pushy and just not, like, interfering or offending them? Yeah. So I said to an earlier caller, it's important to just sort of be human and just kind of just be human beings together and talk about whatever, you know, it's it's impolite to sort of force somebody to talk about something they don't want to talk about. If they want to, though, if they're sort of interested in any way, um, take them as far as they want. If at any point they say, nope, I don't, I don't want this, I don't want to talk about it, well, here's the thing. Always look to Christ as your example in, in, in everything, and especially in this. He says, look, you go somewhere and they reject what you have to offer if they don't uh, accept your word. He doesn't say, all right, well, try again, force it down their throat. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say, you know, stand on the street and tell them that they're all going to hell. He says, leave. Leave and knock the dust off your feet as you leave that town. So you engage them as far as they wish to be engaged and no further, not one step further than that. Um, and I think that's something that really turns people off is that they, they see people representing Christianity as, as pushy, as you're, I think you're rightly asking how to not do that. Well, don't push. You know, you, you walk with them as far as they want to walk. And when they say, nope, I don't want to walk any further with this, they say, okay, they say, all right, and then leave. And I think that's actually more intriguing than, than there, there are a lot of people that sort of act like it's a sort of insecurity. No, I need you to believe me. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure. That sort of shows a weakness in that person's faith, if anything. Uh, so you know, take them as far as they want to go and then leave them alone. I have a couple of uh, co workers that are Hindus. And I've been stumped a few times when we start talking about, you know, my my religious life and their religious life. Um, I don't know how to guide the conversation uh, because there's no frame of reference. There's no common uh, frame of reference. Like, uh, for example, for a, a Protestant, there would be you know, the Bible or Christ or God, the Church, etc. Mm -hmm. But I need uh, maybe one or two pointers on how to start uh, uh, putting some seeds that can lead to further conversations where we can go a little bit more deeper of uh, why am I Catholic? You know, why does it matter what religion is the true religion? But I don't know how to do that. Uh, could you give me some pointers? Yeah, I'd be happy to do that. There's two ways you can guide the conversation. Uh, and both ways, I think, are valid. And you, if you have a decent conversation, you'll probably go down both paths. One way would be to use questions to investigate the evidence for Hinduism. So you could ask the person, you know, I have my book, Why We're Catholic. Uh, I mean, you could ask them, so, you know, should I be a Hindu? Why, why would someone be a Hindu? What, what do you believe? And what's great is even if you don't know anything, anybody can do this. An atheist could do this. Say, look— Tell me, what is Hinduism? What do you teach? What do you believe? And then second, well, why do you believe that? Why do you think that that's true? And there are varying schools of Hinduism, Hinduism, and this is, you know, you'll be prepared to do a lot of listening because Hinduism is a very old, uh, multifaceted uh, religion with the, which a with a rich uh, history behind it. Uh, so it's difficult to summarize the beliefs associated with Hinduism, but some core concepts would be the idea of um, eternality, of things always existing, of a pantheon of gods, possibly an infinite number, or at least a very large number, uh, that 
in life, our goal is to kind of escape this life because we're kind of trapped in an endless cycle of reincarnation. Uh, so to say, well, why should I believe that that's true? What evidence do you have for that? Uh, what ev- is there a good reason to think we are being reincarnated? If if um, God or the law of karma, whatever it is, is making us live life after life after life, why? Is it to, well, it's to learn from the mistakes you made in the past life? Well, yeah, but if I can't remember those mistakes, how is that fair? Uh, you know, so you could ask questions, you know, what do you believe? Why do you believe that? It Does that make sense? And that can help possibly show, hey, there might be some things about Hinduism. There's some, there's some problems here. But then on the, the other path would then be about offering positive evidence for Christianity. And I think what Hindus and Christians can come together to talk about would be the person of Jesus. Uh, Hindus generally believe that Jesus was a, a holy man, a, a wise man. Uh, one might, they might use the term a guru, uh, one who understood his own divine consciousness. What a Hindu may say is, well, Jesus said he's God, but we're all God because we're all part of the divine one, so to speak. And that's where I, I might point to the evidence from the New Testament and say, well, no, Jesus isn't a, a guru. He, doesn't, he didn't teach Hindu theology or philosophy of God. He says, you know, in John 17, 3, he spoke of the only true God, uh, the Father being the only true God. Uh, but he also refers to himself as God uh, in John eight fifty eight, John twenty twenty eight. 28. Uh, in, in Scripture, it says that in John 5.18, when Jesus talked about God as his Father, the Jews wanted to stone him because uh, he made himself equal with God. And then he demonstrated his divinity by rising from the dead. So I think that, you know, questioning Hinduism and then looking to the person of Jesus and saying, look, if Jesus, we read here in the Bible, Jesus said there's one true God, but he said that he's God. He's God's only son, and he rose from the dead. Uh, nobody in Hinduism has done that, or there's no evidence that they've done that. Uh, how would you explain that Jesus did this if he's not uh, God the Son, uh, the image of the true God, the one God? So that's an approach I might take. I'd also recommend in the book that uh, you'll be receiving, Why We're Catholic, I have chapters that talk about how we know God is one, and he created the world, uh, how we know Jesus is God, and as well as practical arguments against reincarnation. Uh, That would be in the last chapter before the chapter on heaven. So those resources might be helpful with your coworkers in the book that you'll receive. So stay on the line so they can, our call screener can get your address. Is that, I know that was a lot, but is that a helpful explanation? Oh, it was excellent. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jose. Uh, Thank you for that call. I have have a question regarding annulment. Yes. Um, I have been divorced for 16 years. I am not planning on getting remarried, even though I'm in a relationship now. Um, I'm just wondering how important is it for me to get an annulment or not? Yes. And then the second piece to that is, is it still legal for me to go to communion? It's always that communion question. Right. Okay, two, two questions. Number one, I'll take the second one first. Uh, a common misunderstanding is to think because you're divorced, ipso facto, you can't receive communion, and that's not true. Now, of course, if, if you committed a mortal sin in the process, now sometimes in divorce you've got mortal sin on both sides. Sometimes you have a totally innocent spouse, and the other is not innocent, there's always sin involved in divorce, but, you know, of, of course, if you've confessed all, all of your known mortal sins and you are not, you have not attempted to be remarried outside of the church, then yes, you can uh, receive communion. So that's number one. But no, number two, as far as the getting in an annulment, one thing that I think, Mary, um, you need to really understand, take this to prayer, is that from the church's perspective, you're still married. You know, when we, when we say, I got a divorce, the, the Catholic Church does not recognize a divorce from a justice of the peace or, you know, whomever out there says, okay, we grant you a divorce. Church doesn't recognize that. If you were married, you are presumed married by the church. And so for you to date someone else, that would be like me being married to my wife, Valerie, 
going out and dating somebody else. I can't do that. Why? Because I'm married, all right? Can't do that. So I would encourage you to really think about that when you say you're in a relationship. What is that relationship for? Is it just friendship? Because if it goes beyond that, you know, you're in dangerous territory there. And even though you're not, you know, if you're planning on not getting remarried, there's no need for an annulment. You certainly can get an annulment. And because of the fact that you're in a relationship now, um, I, I would recommend that you uh, start the annulment proceeding because, uh, you know, friendships lead to more. But, but really think about, Mary, the fact that you are already married, presumably, un- until you get that uh, annulment. You know, at Cy, a lot of folks forget this, that every annulment process doesn't end with an annulment. Sometimes the church says, no, you have a valid marriage, and we're not granting an annulment. And when you have somebody that's already in a relationship and they're all emotionally joined in everything else, that leads to all kinds of problems, including people leaving the church and getting married outside of the church and all sorts of things. And certainly we don't want that to happen. I'm calling because one of my students, we were talking about the Reformation, and I thought this would be a great time to, to call and talk to uh, uh, Dr. Weisskopf uh, about maybe the five uh, high points of Martin Luther's uh, objection to what was going on in the church at the time. Sure, yeah. So, uh, Tony, thanks so much for the, for the call and the question, and uh, thank you for, for teaching catechism to, uh, you know, in your parish. Sir. It's a very important work, a necessary work, so thank you for that. Um, you know, there are many problems that Martin Luther actually had with the, with the church during his time. I mean, the biggest problem, probably, and the one that uh, uh, we should focus on, and what he really got himself into trouble for, was he called into question the authority of the Pope, really. Um, and what I mean by that is that everyone kind of associates the beginnings of the Protestant Reformation or Revolution with indulgences, right, and the so-called selling of indulgences. And obviously there was some uh, abuse and issues with many of the indulgence preachers at the time and, and how they portrayed the Church's teachings um, about indulgences. But um, And Luther nailed his 95 Theses, you know, uh, allegedly on the church door of Wittenberg in October 1517, and so um, people always assume that that's, that's the issue. And really that wasn't the issue. If you read through the 95 Theses, the, the issue that Luther had was he called into question whether the Pope had the authority to even grant an indulgence. Mm-hmm. And so, and then he go. He went even further and called into question. You know, did Matthew does Matthew sixteen actually approve, so to speak, from Scripture uh, that Jesus gave these these keys, you know, to, to Peter himself and to then to Peter's uh, successors, the popes. And so that's really what got him into trouble. And and as as he furthers his writings and he gets into fifteen twenty when he writes three very specific treatises that kind of form the bedrock and foundation of his teaching. That's his central argument: is questioning the authority of the pope. Um, to the point where he even gets to the point where he thinks of the Pope as the Antichrist, that the Pope is what's completely wrong with the Church. And so and that's why I like to refer to the Protestant you know, uh, Reformation not as a, ref- a form, but as a revolution, because that's what he did. He, he decided to um, not seek the reform of the Church and bring it back to its pristine state, but rather to destroy it, to get rid of it and replace something else. So he took the authority of the papacy and the authority of the teaching of the Church in terms of its magisterium, away from the Church and put it into the hands of individual believers and um, put the, the thor- authoritative source of God's divine revelation in the Scriptures, in the Scriptures alone. Um, and that was his, that was his significant uh, beef. In this segment, a caller seeks advice on his struggles with impurity. Avail yourself to the sacraments on a regular basis, as regular as you can. If you can get to daily Mass, Javier, man, that, that is going to help you tremendously to confession. Try to go on a weekly basis. I, I mentioned to Sai yesterday, I went to confession just this Saturday and just had a tremendous experience of God's grace just flooding into my soul. I was driving my car home, and I, I just was rejoicing in the Lord. And I, you know, it's one of those moments, Javier, and we, we don't walk by feelings, we walk by faith, but God touches our hearts. Javier, you got to know God knows right where you are. He knows what you need, and he will give it to you, most especially through the sacraments. But also, there's a principle in St. Paul in, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8, where St. Paul says, 
Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, pure, good, lovely, of a good report, if there be any virtue, any praise, think on these things. We have to get the bad stuff out of our heads, and the only way that's going to happen is if we don't let it in to start with. Get rid of the television, get rid of the, the images that you know, Javier, you don't need. Get out your Bible, read sacred scripture, get some good DVDs, CDs, books, from right here at Catholic Answers, and fill your mind. I will guarantee you, if you trace the time that you spend, you're going to discover what's going into your mind. And you can have all the intentions of the world, oh, I want to be good, I want to be good, but if you're watching, you know, i got to keep this G-rated, if you're watching yes, not you good stuff, <laughs> not good stuff, what's going to happen? It's going to fill your mind. So I would say those are, are two absolutely crucial principles. It's the old principle of GIGO, right? Garbage in, garbage out. And pray, pray, pray. You have to have regimented prayer. We have to pray daily. You know, we make time side for everything else. You know, i got to be here at such such time here, such and such time. We'll make an appointment with God. I need to pray, and I have to do it at this time. I guarantee you, Javier, you'll see benefits if you keep to those principles. So really, I gave three principles because the regimented prayer is also crucial. Javier, uh, thank you very much for that call. Thanks for watching Catholic Answers Live. Join us each weekday for our live radio broadcast or check out our website at catholic.com. You can find us on YouTube at youtube.com slash catholiccom or on Facebook simply by searching Catholic Answers. Jesus Christ is the light of the nation, and we'll see you next time on Catholic Answers Live.